Hi, and welcome to the fourth in our Conceive Baby webinar series. My name's Tasha Jennings, founder of Conceive Baby. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a naturopath, nutritionist, natural fertility specialist, and author of The Vitamins Guide and The Fertility Diet, which is sold throughout Australia, the US, the UK, and Canada, as well as online through Amazon, Booktopia, as well as, of course, the Conceive Baby website. I also write and provide expert comment uh, for various media publications, including The Herald Sun, The Age, The New Idea, uh, Mouth of Mums, The Bub Hub, and other pregnancy and baby magazines, as well as pharmaceutical and medical journals. I'm the director of Zycia, which means life, and specialises in premium pregnancy nutrition all the way through from conception and fertility, right the way through to pregnancy and breastfeeding. And it's really been the past six years that I have specialised in fertility and pregnancy. And the decision to specialise in this area really stemmed from my own difficulty falling pregnant. So it started out as a small personal project, uh, really became a career passion as I met with specialists and researchers, uh, both here and internationally and was really inspired by what I was discovering, uh, particularly in relation to uh, the importance of certain nutrients and their bioavailability on fertility and preconception, as well as the long-term health of the developing baby. And this is how my company Zycia was born, alongside the supplement Zycia Natal Nutrients. And more recently, to further support couples in their journey to pregnancy in that facility stage, I developed the Conceive Baby website, which is what you've all joined us through today. Again, this was based on my own experience uh, with fertility. Um, I was lucky enough to have a background in health and nutrition. And with my husband being a cardiologist, uh, we fortunately, I guess, had access to um, the type of qualified expert um, information and the medical context that meant that our fertility journey was relatively short and we are now blessed with two beautiful children uh, photos of whom you will see scattered around the conceive baby website and my aim for conceive baby was really to bring together a team of specialists across all aspects of fertility and preconception health so that other people who um, are struggling like we were, could have access to the type of qualified expert information that we were fortunate enough to have to help you conceive and carry healthy babies as well. And I'm really honoured to have as a member of that expert team, Dr Alex Polikov. Now Dr Polikov is a fertility specialist and a consultant obstetrician and gynaecologist here in Melbourne. He's a specialist in all aspects of male and female infertility and has a special interest in polycystic ovarian syndrome, as well as age-related fertility and endometriosis. His impressive resume also includes a graduate certificate in evidence-based medicine from Monash University, a Masters of Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics from the University of Newcastle, and a Master's of Reproductive Medicine from the University of New South Wales. He also regularly contributes to scholarly research papers as an expert biostatistician. And Dr. Polikov is a fellow of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. And he's a member of the Fertility Society of Australia, as well as the Australasian Gynaecological Endoscopy and Surgery Society. So Alex, that's very impressive and it's a real pleasure to have you here today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of our busy schedule. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, so today we're going to talk about polycystic ovarian syndrome and various manifestations and treatments. Now I have a slide presentation so I'll try to Put it on now. Is that working well? It's coming up now, I think. Okay. Uh, 
No, actually, you might want to try that again. We, oh. I think we're, we're better at helping people fall pregnant than we are at uh, technical. But there it comes. <laughs> Excellent. Slideshow. Is that better? Perfect. Yeah. Go ahead. Wonderful. So this is me. I mentioned I'm a clinical lecturer at the University of Melbourne, as well as a practicing fertility specialist and obstetrician and gynecologist. I am also a clinical director of one of the largest units, Melbourne IVF, at the Royal Women's Hospital. And we deal with all aspects of fertility there. We will talk today about polycystic ovarian syndrome, and it is a very, very common condition. So depending on which population you look at, 5 to 10% of women would have polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's very, very common in women who have infrequent and irregular periods, and about a quarter of women who have no periods have polycystic ovarian syndrome. In the patients that I see a lot of in infertile couples, about a third would have polycystic ovarian syndrome as the main problem that stops them from falling pregnant. And 90% of women who have unwanted hair growth, so hair growth on the face or chin, would have polycystic ovarian syndrome to blame for that manifestation. It is also very common in women with diabetes. So young women with type 2 diabetes, at least 80% of them would have polycystic ovarian syndrome. And women who develop diabetes in pregnancy, about 40% of them would also have polycystic ovarian syndrome. It runs in families. So if mother or sister or any other female relatives have polycystic ovarian syndrome, the woman is more likely to have it as well. The diagnosis relies on three criteria, and you have to have at least two of those present to be diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, it's very important to stress that polycystic ovaries themselves are not sufficient for diagnosis because it is extremely common. At least 20% of all women especially younger women, would have polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. But it doesn't mean that they have polycystic ovarian syndrome. To be diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome, one would have to have something else. For example, if the periods are irregular or infrequent, that would qualify. Also, hyperandrogenism, that means excess of male hormones, such as testosterone. That is one of the hallmarks of ovarian, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And if present in conjunction with polycystic ovaries, would confirm the diagnosis. It is also important to remember that there are many other conditions that may manifest the same as polycystic ovarian syndrome. And those need to be excluded by your doctor. Now, these are the investigations that the doctor would usually look at, and we would look at all the hormone levels, such as luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone. We would look carefully at the male hormone levels in females, such as testosterone, sex hormone binding globulin and free androgen index, and we would do other tests to exclude other conditions, such as thyroid dysfunction, or high prolactin levels. It is also extremely important to have pelvic ultrasound, which usually looks at the ovaries to see if they are polycystic, and I'll explain what that means a bit later on. But also, ultrasound should have a very good look at the lining of the uterus, because endometrial abnormalities are very common in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, especially those women who don't have regular periods. Now, this is the criteria for diagnosing polycystic ovaries. So there has to be at least 12 follicles in at least one ovary. So it's enough to have one polycystic ovary, the other one can be normal. 
and there is a picture of an ultrasound and as you can see there are little black dots which are follicles so that's that's your polycystic ovary that's what it looks like on ultrasound and underneath is a section of an ovary cut open and you can see uh, follicles in the periphery of the ovary and that's what polycystic ovary looks like on when when it the ovary is removed and dissected now hyperandrogenism or excess of male hormones can manifest as hirsutism which is excessive hair growth especially on the face acne and alopecia which is loss of hair in a in a male pattern so male pattern baldness in a woman acne is not a very specific sign especially in younger women in adolescence it's very common and it doesn't mean that the adolescent has polycystic ovarian syndrome they usually grow out of it but in older women if acne is present that points towards polycystic ovarian syndrome uh, primarily most doctors would say that we would use blood levels of male hormones to diagnose hyperandrogenism rather than relying on subjective assessment of acne and hirsutism there are reproductive problems that come together with polycystic ovarian syndrome so usually there is an abnormal menstrual pattern meaning that the periods come infrequently and irregular and usually they are quite heavy and because these periods are caused by anovulation or inability to release an egg every month it is more difficult for these women to fall pregnant also because the periods are abnormal there is a risk of developing what's called endometrial hyperplasia which is a precursor of endometrial cancer and of course as i mentioned before androgen excess can result in hirsutism and acne these are the measures that can be employed for management hirsutism and waxing, shaving and laser are the most common things. I personally prescribe oral contraceptive pill as the first option, but there are other more specialized treatments that are available, which are usually used by either reproductive endocrinologists or dermatologists. These things are not frequently used by your family doctor. The reproductive problems do not stop once you get pregnant. In pregnancy, women with PCOS have much higher risk of gestational diabetes or abnormal sugar metabolism. And they also have increased risk of blood pressure problems during pregnancies, as well as increased risk of cesarean section. And the babies are more likely to be admitted to intensive care unit and to be born prematurely. Interestingly, there is no increased risk of miscarriage in women with PCOS. So once they get pregnant, their chance of continuing the pregnancy is the same as everybody else. So these are the four problems that are common in women with PCOS, and that is abnormal bleeding, androgenic symptoms, which include acne and hirsutism, fertility issues because they find it difficult to fall pregnant and managing weight long term there is increased risk of endometrial cancer as well as diabetes abnormal lipid metabolism high blood pressure and obesity and that may later in life translate into increased risk of heart attack and stroke and possibly breast cancer Insulin resistance is one of the hallmarks of PCOS and that leads to higher levels of diabetes in these women later on in life. Most women with PCOS are overweight or obese and it is extremely important to address weight as 
it improves all the other symptoms and improves the chances of achieving pregnancy naturally. Initially, the aim should be to reduce weight by 5 to 10 percent, and that often results in normalization of all the other abnormalities that are so common in polycystic ovarian syndrome. It is important to address weight in a number of strategies, mainly to reduce dietary energy intake, as well as preventing weight gain. And the importance of exercise cannot be overstated. And the recommendation is at least 150 minutes per week with 90 minutes of moderate to high intensity exercise would usually result in appropriate weight loss and other symptoms of polycystic ovarian syndrome would usually improve. As I mentioned, weight loss is the first line of treatment for polycystic ovarian syndrome. After that, it really depends on what the goal is. For women who are trying to achieve pregnancy, the issue is that they don't ovulate, they don't release an egg every month reliably. And therefore, the aim of therapy, at least initially, is to achieve ovulation, to make them to release an egg every month uh, in a reliable fashion. And there are a number of medications that can be used. The main and the most common one is called clomiphene citrate or clomid. And that is given in a tablet form and it's usually given for five days. So day one is always counted as the day when a period starts. Heavy flow is day one. And I would give Clomid on days five to day nine, and I would get my patients to come and see me for an ultrasound to assess the response on about day 13 or 14. And with Clomid, 80% of women would achieve ovulation. So they would have an egg released. But only half of those women would achieve pregnancy with six months of treatment. And those who don't get pregnant, there are other options available, which include hormone injections with follicular stimulating hormone, which stimulates the ovaries to produce an egg. Or moving on to IVF, that would work quite well, but of course it's very expensive and quite involved. There is another treatment, surgical treatment available, called laparoscopic ovarian drilling. It's a bit of an old-fashioned treatment, and it used to be popular before IVF was available. And essentially what we do, we would do a laparoscopy, so look inside the tummy, and burn some of the ovarian tissue off. And that results in reliable ovulation for the following three to six months. There are issues with this treatment, mainly it destroys some of the eggs that are stored in the ovary, and it may also cause adhesions later on in life, which may cause problems. So that treatment is not often used. I personally only use it for very young women who have very, very good ovarian reserve, probably women under 30 are trying to fall pregnant. Metformin is a very popular treatment, or used to be a very popular treatment, but it's not as effective in achieving ovulation as Clomid, and therefore it's not used as often. And there is a very large trial published quite a while ago, in 2007, in New England Journal of Medicine, which demonstrates that Clomiphene or Clomid is better for ovulation compared to metformin. And therefore, metformin by itself is not often used. But if you are seeing your local doctor, local doctors or general practitioners don't often use metformin, uh, don't often use Clomid. And therefore, metformin may well be 
the first drug that they will use to try to get you pregnant. The target dose is 1.5 to 2.5 grams daily. It has quite significant gastrointestinal side effects, including diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting, indigestion, and abdominal discomfort. And so it's not that pleasant to take. But some patients feel that metformin helps them lose weight. And that's one of the reasons that general practitioners often prescribe it. Long-term treatments, and we're talking about women who have had their babies or don't want to have babies at the moment. Weight loss is extremely important with either lifestyle, medical interventions, or even surgical interventions, such as gastric bending or gastric bypass. The main issue long-term for women with PCOS is the fact that because they don't ovulate, they don't have regular periods, the lining of the uterus can become abnormal to the point where it can be precancerous or even cancerous. And the idea is to protect the lining from turning into cancer. And that can be achieved with using oral contraceptive pill or intermittent progesterones. And the general practitioners usually manage that quite well. But the bottom line is that if someone is diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, they should have endometrial protection when they're not trying to achieve pregnancy. And oral contraceptive pill is probably the simplest and the best way to achieve that. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that polycystic ovarian syndrome is extremely common, but it is very important to remember that polycystic ovaries are not the same thing as polycystic ovarian syndrome. As doctors, general practitioners, and specialists, we concentrate on the presenting problem. So the problem could be abnormal periods, could be infertility, or long-term management of endometrial lining. And the treatment, of course, will depend on the goal of the patient. And the lifestyle modifications are extremely important, extremely useful, and may well achieve desired result in terms of pregnancy or regulating cycles. That's all for me. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for your expert opinion on that. I know we do have quite a few of our viewers and members with PCOS. As you said, it's a very common yet often misunderstood condition. As you explained, there are a vary of symptoms and treatments. Um, so you see PCOS patients in your clinic regularly, obviously? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very common. As I said, about 30% of infertile couples the, the woman would have polycystic ovarian syndrome as the main problem, the main issue that stops her from falling pregnant. Yeah, and I, I know I've heard of a lot of people who are even unaware of they had, that they have the condition because the symptoms are, are things that we often dismiss um, as regular hormone issues. So it's great to see a specialist such as yourself if you do have any concerns in relation to your fertility. So I'd like to wrap up by thanking um, Dr. Polikov on behalf of everyone here uh, for your time today. I know you are very, very busy. Um, so your time and your work on the panel is very much appreciated. So for everyone else, make sure you do stay tuned for our next webinars. Um, the last in our webinar series is actually coming up on the 6th of December. I'll be talking to Dr. Joseph Scroy in relation to preconception health um, at 8 p.m. on Tuesday, the 6th of September. Then we'll be uh, recommencing in February, and I've got a great line of specialists um, booked through in next year. Uh, so make sure you keep registered on the um, Conceive Baby website. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.